Uh, hello, uh, thank you for coming. So my name is Louisa Armbrust, and I'm going to talk about this uh, human experience in both user experience design and in art, and how I see connections between those two fields. So I'm an artist and a designer, and specifically a UX designer. Uh, is there anyone in the audience who is a UX designer? No? OK. Um, so there are a lot of ways to describe or define UX design. So uh, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to use this definition. Um, a user experience uh, design is concerned with every aspect of the user's interaction with a product, service, or company that make up the user's perception of the whole. UX design works to coordinate all the elements that together make up that interface, including layout, visual design, text, brand, sound, uh, interaction that allow for the best possible interaction for the users. So it's a very, it's a user-centered uh, perspective on the design of whatever type of product you're talking about. Um, but for me, being a user experience designer simply means that I spend a lot of time thinking about people trying to do things. And I also think about the same things in the work I do as a fine artist. So today I'd like to talk about a concept that inspires me in both areas uh, and is also at the root of all user experience design. And that is the, co that the concept that there is a gap between the rules for doing a thing and the execution of that rule. When a person attempts to follow a rule, there is always a gap between what the rule describes and what actually takes place. So let's say a person wants to do something, learn something new, take care of some business, have a certain experience. There's going to be steps that they need to go through to complete this goal. But as they follow the rules, their actions are not going to be the same as the rules. There will be this gap. So as a user experience designer, I'm always asking, what are they supposed to do in this interaction with this product, in this, with this service, and what are they actually doing? What actually happens in, in real life when they start to try to do this? So as in the process of designing a product, it it's pretty much involves trying to close those gaps, make sure there aren't those interruptions of expectation, those unexpected events that are unpleasant for a user. But it's important to recognize that this gap is also the source of creativity and possibility. I'll touch more on this later, uh, but first I just want to go through a little bit about the UX design process and the tools that I use in that process. So I don't know if you've seen visual representations of people doing UX. If you have, there's a really high percentage chance that there were post-it notes involved. That seems to be one of, that's part of the brand of doing UX, post-it notes or whiteboard. Um, so a user experience designer uses not just post-its, but a lot of tools uh, that include things like uh, interviews, card sorting exercises, um, analyzing analytics, A-B testing, to learn what the target audience for a specific product are really trying to do what their needs are, what their preferences are, and what's then happening with that product when it starts to be in use. So these post-it notes, I use them to identify categories of information, steps in a process I'm designing, sections of an application, tasks, content, type of user, types of users I'm working with. They're really great because they don't pin you down. You can manage uncertainty. They're just this simple piece of paper, but it's an amazing tool that I'm sure many of you have had a lot of experience with. They are helpful for finding gaps. You can group related things together and then find out that something's missing, or you could say that this one group of ideas you're working with is actually really two groups of ideas, whether that's part of a navigation system or two product ideas that actually need to be separated because you've got too much going on at once. For doing user experience design, to speak for the user, the designer needs to really have 
a familiarity with the users and to be able to empathize with them, really to think uh, like them. They don't actually even need to like the users, they need to be able to actually think like them. That's the more important part. That's the key point of empathy, to have that ability to understand the thinking. And this is a task model. This is something that uh, you put together when you're trying to understand all the steps of a task that the user is trying to accomplish. And then that, for, so for example, this one is all the steps that a sixth grade teacher goes through when they're trying to prepare a lesson. This was something I was using when I was designing a, a, a web application that's a platform for kindergarten through 12th grade students and teachers. And we wanted to know what would a sixth grade math teacher need to do. Following through on this flow of this task, you can then identify where there are pain points. Maybe you've identified a flow of tasks that you're now going to try to have a product idea for solving a pain point, or maybe you have a product that you're aware from your users has pain points in it and you need to identify where things are going wrong. So that's where a task model can be very useful for helping you really think through that process. And here again, we encounter what we're looking for are gaps. Those pain points are gaps. And as a UX designer, I'm trying to close them. So if post-it notes are a hallmark of UX, whiteboards are as well as they are for a lot of us in working life, because they're a great way to quickly sketch. Um, for me in particular, I find I use them when I am doing uh, the overall architecture of an application or a site. Uh, it's a great way to put everything in a, on the whiteboard and then try to decide uh, what belongs. Does everything go here or all the pieces have a place to go? But it can keep, you can keep your thinking loose. From that type of whiteboarding, uh, usually I would be working with an application or site map. This allows you to judge the relationships between the parts that you're trying to put together. Am I making loud knocking noises? No? Just a little bit? Loud hair or something, sorry. Um, so this, the site map is really useful for investigating a larger system. This is something that can be invaluable when you want to sit down with developers and quickly say, okay, we don't know how all the parts work, but we know we have this, we're starting to have this general structure that we need to plan for. You also can look at a sitemap like this and play sort of a which one of these things doesn't belong and look for gaps again. It makes poss it possible to evaluate what features should be included and do that from a user's perspective. And then rough drawings. Sometimes this is the only tool that's needed when trying to get from an idea to a prototype that you can test. So working with a rough drawing, if I can sit down with a developer and say, okay, this is the interaction we're thinking of. Can you build this? Do you need any more information? Here's a post-it with a little more information. And that's all that's needed to start to get to a prototype. Sometimes though, you want to refine that just a little bit and you want to go to a simple wireframe. Uh, this one is uh, for a startup that sells socks online and they wanted to do a subscription structure. Wireframes put the focus on the interactions by framing out the elements of the task. I love wireframes because I think of them as templates for action. Uh, for example, this is a bug tracking app, so when I'm designing it, I need to think about all the tasks involved in developing digital products, and I need to think about the people who will use this product. So in this case, you have a bunch of different people, developers, designers, QA people, product people, who are all working together to make something. And I'm creating a wireframe, and at least I'm really quickly and roughly putting elements down, uh, often in the rough sketch or on whiteboard, and then whatever I put down into the wireframe is going to guide other people's actions in the future when they encounter the finished product. And if it's done well, it won't have big gaps between what it's supposed to do and how it really works for people. 
and it will help them to complete their task and reach a goal. And I find this really, really satisfying. And the final layer of the UX, that, that the UX designer is involved with um, depends on what type of designer you are. I came from a visual design background, so I sometimes do do the final visual layer, um, but sometimes I don't, and I hand that off to someone else who's going to, you know, really massage the, the CSS. Uh, the visual layer is very important, of course, because it creates that first impression on the user. It also helps to communicate the interactive possibilities or the affordances that show the person what they're actually supposed to do with what they're looking at. Uh, you know, it, it shows you, oh, that is probably clickable because it, it looks like it's a button or it looks like it's a call to action and I, should do, I can do something there. So the this is a visual and interactive layer for a digital learning platform that I was mentioning earlier for kindergarten through high school students and teachers. So the heart of UX design is basing design on how people really do act and use products and not on a theoretical model that sounds good at the, at the beginning or an abstract business idea. And you want to bring these ideas through testing as soon as possible and as many times as possible to get to something that really meets where the user comes and meets it and that you have no gaps. So I want to move out from specifically talking about digital product designs and look further at this concept of the gap um, because it's quite useful uh, but also entertaining and enlightening, I believe. Um, so let's start looking at an everyday activity like reading a book. What are the steps to completing this task? So let's say I want to read a book and I want to read an actual physical book that I'm going to check out from the library. This task for me has several steps. I'm going to get on my phone and use an app that allows me to find the book and reserve it. Then I'm going to get an email at some point telling me that my book is ready to pick up. Then I need to find the time to go to the library when the library is open. I need to make sure I didn't forget my library card when I do go to the library, find the book on the shelf, etc. And at each step of this process, I know sort of the rules to get my book so I can read my book. But my actions will always be different from the actual rules. There's always that separation between the set of rules I'm following and what's actually happening. Another a, a visible rule that we have in real life are the markings painted on the street. The act of driving is not, uh, does not conform directly to that guideline. I should say that the most important thing about this gap that I'm talking about is that it's funny. If you try to describe something to someone, your description will not be the thing itself. Polish-American scholar Alfred Kurbzinski famously said, the map is not the territory. And this was very nicely illustrated for us. I'm sure you remember this when Apple first released its Maps app. Um, this is a nice example of a part of New Zealand that has mountains, but certainly not normally these incredibly stretched, weird, tall, spiky peaks. So the unexpected is funny. Uh, and it is the root of all jokes, as many people, including Freud and Wittgenstein, and more recently, uh, Italian philosopher Paolo Verno, have uh, mentioned and gone into in depth, but I, I won't do that here. Um, the underpinnings of comedy are mishaps and mistakes. A word used in an unconventional way, someone who goes in the outdoor, cases of mistaken identity, these things all belong in that gap between the rule and the action. And that's what inspires my work as a visual artist. So these drawings are some of my work. And my relationship to the gap as a visual artist is very different from when I'm doing work as a user experience designer. Um, for these drawings, I was taking the, the visual language of goals for sports. Uh, like football and American football and lacrosse and hockey 
And then playing with that idea of a very clear goal and then messing with that to make it be either impossible to use, impossible to figure out, um, or just incredibly difficult or silly. So I'm using the visual language of games and sports to illustrate this gap that I find so interesting. Uh, I've done a lot of work using pictograms. Uh, these pictograms are playing hockey in a game that has no borders, more than two teams. Uh, these players are breaking the rules. Uh, they're making up their own rules. Some of them are whales. Unlike in design, where I'm trying to identify and close gaps, in art, I'm reveling in the gap and trying to see how far I can take it, how much I can find a rule and then dance around it. I'm currently working on a series of drawings of people doing things in the dark. So this was actually partially inspired by thinking up app ideas. I was thinking about daily, people's daily habits and you know, those behaviors that maybe people want to either change or gain or get rid of. And it got me really thinking about sort of all the day-to-day -day things we do that we might have our own personal rule sets for, that we may not, maybe we don't even know we have a rule about it, but we always do things a certain way. And so I started trying to draw things like that. And I wanted to describe actions that aren't normally described in detail because they are considered inconsequential or very personal. Uh, so I chose to make the drawings like pictographs simple enough to show a universal quality, while at the same time showing something really personal. So is there something, these, these are something that we don't make rules about, or maybe they, they are. So what are the rules for wrapping yourself up in a blanket on the floor with a glass of wine by your head? So I was thinking about people's personal habits actions with no, person, no other purpose than just for your own satisfaction. There are other artists who have been inspired by this idea of using a fairly universal, uh, generic uh, pictogram to, to and, and its sort of authoritative uh, sense and combining that with an ambiguous or unexpected situation. Uh, Pippo Leone is an artist based in France who has a Facts of Life series where he does this, juxtaposes those pictograms with uh, emotional and political content. And this is another piece of his of a pictograph family bored with each other at dinner watching pictograph sex on TV. So I'm, so I'm thinking about, can you concisely describe sitting in the dark doing nothing? What are the rules for quiet solitude or in-between actions? And this brings to mind some of the empathetic thinking I've done when designing for teachers. One of the personas that I worked with for one product was uh, the exhausted teacher, home on her couch at the end of the day, needing to plan the next day's lesson on her iPad. And there are many details of attitude and expectation that I keep in mind as a designer to make the product work better for the user. Once I was putting these figures in the dark, doing idiosyncratic things, of course I had to think about people and screens. And so here we have a person who is doing a yoga stretch, taking their cue from a bear that does yoga. This is a YouTube video. You can actually see this on YouTube. In fact, you can see a whole world of videos of bears doing stretches that we think are yoga. So here we have a, a user, a person using a funny video as if it was an instructional video. And this misuse of instructions is a variation on the gap. This is what happens when there are rules, and even if we are serious and really try to follow them exactly, it's impossible because we're human and we're not abstract concepts. I think that this is a meaningful thing to think about in art. It, it is a use value of art but it is also meaningful in design 
to think about our products in context of reality at every step. It can get a bit intense to think about all these things at once. Uh, here's someone at their work, with their work screen set up doing some yoga to relax, maybe. This series of people in doing things in the dark was also inspired by having insomnia. Um, for a couple years I had really bad insomnia. Um, and I wanted to find a way to make something of that, something that felt productive instead of just sort of terrible. And so I was thinking about how do you do insomnia? What are the rules for insomnia? When you have insomnia, a rule is already being broken. You're supposed to be asleep, it's the time for you to sleep, and you're not asleep. Sleep doctors have rules for insomniacs. They have protocols that you're supposed to solve to fix your insomnia. No TV in the bedroom, go to bed at the same time at night, wake up at the same time every morning. But the actual experience of insomnia is not these rules. The actual experience is a series of tossings and turnings with thinking going on. So I tried to put that into these drawings. I tried to describe these things that don't get covered by the rules. So as you saw, I was already thinking about sports and games, and I wanted to use something more universal than hockey or goal sports. So I started to think about just basic physical exercises. They are a great example of something really common in every day that are individual but also universal. There are many different rules for exercises, regimes, routines, workouts, but there is an infinite amount of experience of exercise. Just think of walking on its own. That is a whole world of experiences. I was inspired in particular by thinking about exercises that came from the past. Rules that were for putting bodies in motion that were originally thought of and performed by people who are no longer with us. And yet there are records of these older exercises and we have the ability, because we have bodies and we have some documentation that survives from the past, of putting our bodies into the same position as someone had in the past. I see this as this way of using exercise instructions as a kind of time machine. And so I was really taken when I learned about My System by J.P. Muller. This was a system of exercise that was first published in 1907, and it was developed by Muller, who was a Danish exercise uh, gym teacher. And his system became wildly popular. It was performed for 40 years at least, all over Europe and all over the Americas. People were waking up early in the morning, putting themselves through precise sets of exercises, taking a very precisely described cold bath, rubbing themselves down with a towel in precisely described ways. It's crazy, but really funny and awesome. And the pictures describing these exercises are really delightful. I particularly like his sweater, um, and I like the nice perfect circles that the diagrams show you can put your head in. So the more I looked at these, the more I wanted to bring, ha, let them have some sort of new life, to reanimate them. I was excited to think about these exercises from long ago as templates for movements now. To think that someone can do something in their house, in the dark, late at night, when they can't sleep, an exercise that was formally systematized 108 years ago, that's amazing to me. It's such a simple thing, but I find it quite, uh, quite entertaining and exciting. So another project that I have been working on that involves uh, an inspiration from an instructional manual for exercise is a project called Blue Swimmer that's based on a book of competitive swimming techniques that are illustrated with underwater stop motion photographs. And this is a cyanotype. It is a life-size photograph. So the, pho the image is me, and the photo is made by putting sensitized fabric in the sun and lying on it for about 10 minutes 
and then putting it in water. And it gives you a blue and white image, but it also gives you a lot of unexpected things that you can't predict. Because water develops the image and stops exposure, you always get strange artifacts. And so what I'm doing is I'm trying to mimic these poses from this competitive swimming manual published in Hungary in the 50s. But I'm taking a underwater stop motion photograph and reinterpreting it as a still posed shot of me lying on the ground. There's a basic misuse of information going on here. These are some of the photographs from the book. And so in this process, I'm losing a lot of context the fact that it's underwater, um, the purpose of it in general, but I'm creating a new image based on an old template. So there's a tremendous richness of possibilities for action that exists between the model and the rule, or the rule, and the actual performance of the exercise, uh, a gesture, an interaction. So this is true of other systems of exercises and other systems of rules and instructions beyond exercise and physical movement. So I'd like to leave you with this quote, which I love. And that's, art is what makes life more interesting than art. Uh, Robert Filiou was a French artist in the 20th century. And I, I like this because it's like a, a zen cone. It's, uh, an illog seemingly illogical statement that succeeds in conveying something profound about the way art and life are linked inextricably. And art is good, very skilled at reckoning with the gap that I've been talking about. It can deal with the multitude of possibility that is there. We can't describe an iota of life without creating a gap between our description and the reality. And that gap is the place of creativity, art, and new ideas. So it's more than worthwhile to watch the gap. Thank you. <laughs>